Oh, good. We're recording. Um, so she's not, she's a clinical psychologist. She's written um, a couple of books. What your ADHD child wishes you knew working together to empower kids for success in school and life. And she also has recently come up with the ADHD solution card deck, which is helpful for um, kids, young adults, families with ADHD, with learning disabilities, mental health issues. Now, here's something I didn't know about you, Sharon. You wrote her unique perspective as a sibling in an ADHD household, mm -hmm. combined with decades of experience as a clinical psychologist and educator, helps her to be this fantastic um, therapist for families and adults, helping communication, closer connections. She also lectures, she does workshops. She spoke, she has spoken internationally. Um, and oh my God, we are so lucky to have you. So thank you. And um, with no further ado, Sharon, you can, you can talk. Welcome. I'm going to share my screen and we will we'll 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 start right we'll start right away and there'll be time for questions um, for sure and I will do my best to make sure there's plenty of time at the end for Q and A as well as some questions along the way. So I'm going to share my screen. We're going to get started. Perfecto. Okay. So um, I do not see the chat. So I want to I've, I've activated the chat. So first of all, I want to say that if you're here tonight. I want you to go to this uh, address and get a copy of your free downloadable, which will cover, which will be your handout of a lot of the things that I'm talking about today. So um, let's get started. I'm just trying to move the chat so I can see it when I need to. All right, these are very stressful and uncertain times. And even though, you know, last year with all of the remote learning was very difficult and stressful, this year, just when we thought this summer that we were over the hump, this a virus came back and, and kind of roared back. And so now what we're seeing are, you know, are higher levels of anxiety. Um, and there are novel transitions without a clear map. Kids aren't sure what's happening, where to go, what, how to protect themselves. Um, we're seeing, um, you know, lower motivation at times, higher levels of perfectionism, some resilience fatigue, and definitely higher levels of frustration. Kids are tired of life not being the same, and they're 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 desperate for anything that's going to speak or that's going to speak to their their need to communicate and be with peers and go to school and have a childhood. So one of the things that we've seen a lot of is increased anxiety and depression in kids with and without ADHD. Um, we know that anxiety disorders are problems related to fears and worries. Anxiety disorders differ based on the focus of a person's worry. Anxiety is all about safety and security. It wants to make uncomfortable feelings and uncertainty go away immediately. Now, anxious kids actually uh, often have low self-confidence and problematic peer relationships, as well as academic difficulties and family conflict. We know that anxiety is a natural human response that's evolved over the centuries and comes from serving a purpose, how to keep us alive. So our goal isn't to dismiss it entirely because we can't, it's how we're wired, but to respond to it in ways that are healthy and manageable. Kids and adults are justifiably anxious right now. Some are afraid to leave the house. Others are worried about returning to school and seeing friends or you know, infecting a, an, el a, a, an elder or a grandparent or an aunt in the family. So we have to address their fears with information, coping strategies and plans of action in case someone gets sick. You know, there've been numbers of stories of kids who go to school on the first day and somebody is tested positive for COVID after that very first day, which is very distressing. Interestingly, children of anxious parents are more likely to be anxious and to perceive ambiguous situations of, as threatening. 
So one thing we want to do as parents is to monitor how much we're talking about our anxiety and concern within earshot of our children, because their antenna's up and they're tracking what we're saying, even if we think they're not paying attention. And finally, depression. So there is a level of despair that many kids have felt over this last year and, and sort of a lethargy, a, di a difficulty taking pleasure from things that were previously fun and enjoyable. We call that uh, anhedonia. And so there's been a number of kids who've moved on from disappointment to a loss of hope about the future. And then this sense, oh, things are changing, things are opening up and then being having to pull back. We know from the research that untreated anxiety can lead to depression. Then there is a, a, an, a kind of powerlessness and a lack of agency with depression. And that anger actually can be a cover for depression. It can be the gatekeeper. So we see a lot of anger or defiance and underneath that we may see depression. Oops, sorry. So let's do a poll. I wanna kick this off right away. And I'd like you to go into the chat with, with me and um, tell me what is the biggest issue that's confronting your child and you right now? So adjusting to the educational environment, navigating social relationships, increased anxiety or depression, showing a lack of interest and low motivation, completing homework and turning it in, and managing screens appropriately. So they're numbered one through six and throw them up for me so I can see six, okay, two, social relationships, lack of interest and in managing screens, navigating social relationships, anxiety, adjusting to educational environment, managing screens, um, navigating relationships, managing screens. Great, thank you. Please feel free to put your, to put your situation in the chat. This is the best way that we can create community online for this presentation. I see uh, one, five and six, six and five, seven. I don't have my own child, but I want to work in the field. Okay, thank you for saying that, Rachel. All right, so let's move forward because um, I have a lot to cover and I wanna make sure we get as much of it as possible. So in my book, What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew and my card deck, the ADHD solution deck, I talk about the five C's approach. And so we, our goal is to create um, uh, win-win scenarios for everyone so that we're working together for solutions that are based on participation and incentives rather than punishment and um, uh, negative consequences. So when you offer choices and negotiate collaborative solutions, your frustration level goes down and your kid's sense of competency goes up. So this is a found, this uh, approach has, is, has its roots in strength-based thinking and attentive awareness. So what are the five C's? Self-control, you, the adult, you're gonna manage yourself first. You're going to manage your feelings first and your reactions first so you can act effectively and teach your kids to do the same. It's, you know, for those of you who've traveled on an airplane, it's like the oxygen mask on a plane. You put it on yourself first so you can breathe and then you attend to your child. It's the same thing with self-control. When you're activated, you're just throwing but you're just throwing kindling and logs onto the burgeoning fire that is your child. Compassion. We're going to meet kids where they are, not where you expect them to be. And this lies at the heart of positive parenting alliances. Collaboration. You're going to work together for solutions in ways that include negotiation and compromise. It's not about giving in or not giving in or, you know, you know wrestling with these, you know, endless power struggles. Punishment doesn't work. Research has found over and over again, it doesn't work. What does work is our incentives. And that's when kids have the skin in the game. So when we listen to their ideas and respect their input about any problems or challenges that are going on, we increase their buy-in because they're participating. They feel honored and respected. Even if we do one fraction of what they're suggesting, it's still in the mix. Of course, in terms of safety, you're still the parent. So it's, a it's sort of a delicate balance of when you actually draw the line and you say, I have the final say, and when you say, we'll negotiate that. And usually the final say has to do with health and safety. 
Consistency, you're gonna stick with a plan more often than not. You're gonna allow for exceptions, warn your kids that it's an exception. If they're allowed to have a half hour of television before dinner and you're cooking dinner and you break a glass on the floor, guess what? You say, hey, you get another half hour, this is an exception. And then when you get back together for dinner, you say, I just want you to know that's not the nor new normal. Because kids with ADHD, kids who are level one on the spectrum, kids who are twice exceptional, these kids will, will think that what this exception is the new normal, unless you tell them flat out that it's not. You're not aiming for perfection because no parent can be perfect. No one is perfect. I mean, I'm, my kids are in their 20s and I have to say I have regrets, deep regrets about some of the things I did, including a beautiful yelling match when my daughter was 15, wanted to go out on New Year's Eve, with her crop top and her jean jacket. And I literally blocked the door with my body and yelled at her until she put a coat on. And she said, I'm not wearing a hat. I was like, fine, whatever. So we all have our moments, okay? And I wanna share some of mine with yours so you don't think, oh, Dr. Selena, is it all together? No, I'm learning and living just like you are. So what we want to focus on is actually resilience. And that has to do with efforting. It's the way kids try, maybe it succeeds and they can try again, or maybe it doesn't, and they have to regroup and try something else. This is what fosters a growth mindset. And it's so essential for concrete thinkers like our neurodiverse kids. Predictability is comforting. That's also part of, of, of consistency. And routines foster those all important executive functioning skills that kids really need. The last C is celebration. And this is noticing and acknowledging what's working by continuously offering specific words of praise and encouragement. We're validating what we see them do when we ask them to do something. Dr. Barbara Fredrickson and her colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania did a lot of research around 2008, 2010, and they found that the ideal positivity ratio should be three positives for every negative. So in the chat, I'd like to ask you, what do you think the ratio is in your household? For every one positive thing your child hears, how many negatives do you think they hear? And it could be what they hear from other people in addition to what they tell themselves. I'm gonna share with you some of the things that I've heard over the last few years, and those numbers are very high. So what I've heard is anything, so I see three and eight, anybody else? For every one positive, how many negatives do you think your child hears or says to himself in the course of the day, or both? Okay, four, two, okay. So when I've traveled around the world, that what I've heard is anywhere from 10 to 30. And 30 was what kids themselves told me. Dr. Sharon, is it what I say to myself or what other people say to me? And I said, well, we're looking for the grand total, so both. And the teenagers who were in this particular group said at least 30, at least 30. That is terrible. That's a terrible way to live because you can't build self-esteem when you're living in that kind of ratio. So we need to try to change it by paying attention to the small things that are going well and the big things too. This also counteracts the negativity bias in our brains. Okay. So what is ADHD? So I'm just gonna share my definition. Um, and um, ADHD is a chronic condition marked by persistent inattention, uh, hyperactivity, and sometimes impulsivity that is more frequent and severe than is typically observed in children of the same age. It's a novelty seeking brain. Interest fosters motivation. These are creative outside the box thinkers. ADHD is a performance-based disorder based on executive functioning skill deficits. So these are kids who fidget, they're restless, they're easily distracted, they may have difficulty following instructions, they may appear not to listen, they may lose things, they may talk excessively, they may have organizational difficulties, they may be careless, have poor attention to detail, be shy, have difficulty keeping friends, they make them but they you know, overwhelm them and they're too intense. 
ADHD affects 10% of students in the United States. And um, about five to 10% of kids with ADHD outgrow it. Although as Ari Tuckman and I have discussed, we're not sure if people actually outgrow it or if they adapt to living with it um, and they know the tools for it um, at that point. And also because the measures for um, assessing adult ADHD are not as robust as those for kids. So right now the thinking is five to 10%. Um, there's a development over time from hyperactive impulsive to inattentive or combination ADHD. 55% of adults with ADHD have at least one child with ADHD. And if one child has ADHD, there's a 33% chance of a second child having it. Um, ADHD rarely travels alone. About 70% of kids with ADHD also have a learning disability. 83% of families living with ADHD and coexisting conditions report more significant stress than families without it. Of course, many kids with ADHD have some activities in which they have no difficulty um, with focus, effort, or self-control due to their strong interest or affinity. This is what Dr. Thomas Brown calls this, the great mystery of ADHD. Now, let's just take a quick look at executive functioning skills because we're gonna be focusing on these quite a bit today. Um, executive functioning skills are where everything comes together. They're the command center of the brain. And if you take your hand and you put it in your, on your forehead, your executive functioning skills sit here, primarily in your prefrontal cortex. Uh, in my culture, I call this the oive section of the brain because kids do things and I say to myself, oy vey, what were you thinking? Um, and I hope you're laughing and smiling. I can't see you, but I hope you are. Um, you can also call it the oh my goodness part of your brain. So executive functioning skills connect, prioritize, and integrate cognitive functions moment by moment. It's a term used to describe the directive capacities of the brain. It's not one thing but it's a series of sound engineers in the sound booth who are working with each of the Beatles to create Abbey Road. You know, we have a, a, with somebody for Paul on his voice and on the keyboard, and we have somebody for John with his voice and on the guitar. You know, it just, we have all of these engineers trying to create beautiful music from the thoughts, behaviors, and feelings we're having. We're working together. Executive functions, integrate memory with what we see and think about right now. And, with, and this working memory is a fundamental aspect of, exe of executive functioning. It's linked to emotional control and it draws on past experiences and relates them to current situations or how to project into the future. Without um, working memory, people live in present time and can't make historical connections from even five minutes ago. Interestingly, emotion drives this working memory engine and, um, and processing speed is related to working memory because it allows a person, it sort of monitors how quickly a person can grasp and assimilate information efficiently. I had a client who said to me, it's like this, Dr. Sharon. I'm like, okay, how is it? This is a middle schooler. And she said, it's like the file comes in my brain and the papers go everywhere. And I start to pick up the papers, but the next file comes in and those papers go everywhere. And then the next file comes in and those papers go everywhere. And I'm still trying to pick up the papers from the original file. So that's the kind of overwhelm we're talking about. Struggle with processing speed, struggle with working memory to remember what I did last time this situation happened and apply it to this current situation. That's why ADHD is a performance-based disorder. And I don't like to use the word disorder, but I think in order to emphasize my point, I need to say that. So what is the diagnostic overlap? Because ADHD rarely travels alone. It brings its friends. Nearly two thirds of children with ADHD have at least one co-occurring condition. Um, behavioral or conduct problems are the most common type around 50, 52%, followed by anxiety closer to 34 um, and um, a depression, uh, ASD, et cetera. Now, interestingly, um, about 1% of adolescents aged 12 to 17 with current ADHD had a parent reported uh, substance abuse disorder. 
Um, interestingly, over 50% of kids diagnosed with ASD, that's the primary diagnosis, have ADHD, but only 14% of kids whose primary diagnosis is ADHD have been diagnosed with ASD. And it's usually level one ASD, that's what we're talking about. Um, a coexisting mood conditions are really common, especially in adolescents, and girls are often referred and treated for these and not evaluated for ADHD. Um, okay. So alternative learners and school. So school is often the worst domain of functioning for kids with ADHD and the area where attention issues are first noticed. Um, uh, these kids have biologically based challenges with maintaining attention in uninteresting tasks. And that has to do with the relationship of dopamine, um, uh, the ratio of dopamine, excuse me, in their brain and norepinephrine, um, which we're not gonna go into, but of course we know that it, kids and adults who have uh, ADHD have lower amounts of dopamine and norepinephrine in their brains. Um, Kids with learning disabilities, and again, those are that's 70% of kids with ADHD, have more trouble in school and outside of school than other kids do. And of course, there's a misconception that uh, learning disabilities are correlated with intelligence. Uh, in you know, in um, around 70% in one survey of parents and educators linked learning disabilities to autism and intellectual disabilities as well. It's very sad. Okay, so um, we know that executive functioning skills are critical for school and life. And here are some of the questions that are related to executive functioning skills. Can I regulate my physical impulses and emotions to attend to what I'm doing or expected to do? What are doable goals and how do I set them? How do I shift from one task to, and, or concept to another? How can I learn from trying and regrouping and trying again? How do I organize my activity, time, and ideas? How do I decide what's most important? Can I recall details for exams? What's it like to listen and write notes simultaneously? What does it mean to understand how I learn and how I think about things? Can I check my work for mistakes? Am I aware of how I interact with others? So, in order to collaborate with your kids to have effective interventions, we have to have collaborative conversations. So collaborative and meaningful incentives are the most effective way to create lasting change with ADHD kids. And this collaboration increases their buy-in to the problem solving uh, process. Now, collaboration means discussing neutrally what occurs before, during, and after a situation and what strategy was used and what strategy could be used. And the way we're gonna do that is with reflective listening. And it works pretty simply. What you say, what you, say you hear, you ask your kid a question, and then when they respond, you say, hmm, I heard you say X, did I get that right? Is there anything else? And now you're starting to get information about what matters to them. Generally, there's something that kids wanna change about themselves. And that is on your list of things you'd like to see be different about them as well. We wanna start with what's on their list. Why not? They're interested in that. We're gonna get more um, cooperation when we do that. So we, wanna, um, we want to ask for their observations about a particular issue and state our own. You as a parent, you wanna think about what do I wanna discuss in advance? And can you come to this conversation with some thought provoking questions? Not why, but how, what, where, and when. You wanna let them know that you heard their ideas and their insights. Brainstorm with the goal of including one of their ideas, at least one in the new plan. And all ideas in a brainstorm are fair game. Reflect on a time with a positive outcome and explore how to apply some of those tools to this issue. Kids with ADHD and anxiety uh, have amnesia for times when they were successful. So we have to be their work, we have to hold that memory of those incidents for them so that we can then offer them up when they're in another situation that they may not be able to recall. 
uh, write down the new elements, uh, the elements of the new clan, post it somewhere, and predict that there will be struggles. Discuss alternatives. What's a possibility of what would happen if we can't follow, if you, you child cannot follow through an agreement, maybe I, adult, cannot follow through on the agreement. Um, it's, always, it's always true that you're going to have struggles and you're gonna to have to renegotiate the agreement and tweak it. That is, um, that's a normal part of the process. Don't get angry or surprised by that. Be like, ah, okay, of course we have to tweak it a little bit. We'll see what, what, what else we can do. Or yes, that's part of living and learning. So let's pause right now for some questions. And um, I'm going to pull up everybody's photo. Uh, we can ask questions in the chat, or if you want to unmute people, Ellen, and they raise their hand, I can answer questions that way. Okay, does anyone have any questions? I just downloaded a bunch of information about ADHD, executive functioning skills, uh, you know, um, uh, challenges and how to collaborate with your kids. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, Sakina. Um, we have to unmute you. Children. Okay. Hi. Okay, start again, please. Hi. Okay. I'm Sakina and I have a I am a Montessori teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a question about the correlation with the executive functioning and ADHD. Do children, if they have don't have ADHD, but they lack the executive functioning skills? Yes. How do you put them together? How do you work with those? This children? is a fantastic question because I forgot to say this and I'm so glad you asked. So we all have executive functioning skills. You, me, kids, we all have it, right? And everyone has strengths and challenges. There are 11 executive functioning skills and I'm gonna go back to that slide just so you can see it. Yeah, sorry, hold on a second. There you go. So there are 11 executive functioning skills, which I've grouped in, in under different um, subheadings. And we all have our strengths and our challenges. For those of us who do not have ADHD, our strengths outnumber our challenges, but we still have them. I, for example, struggle with emotional control. I'm an intense, passionate person and I feel things deeply and I can lose my temper. I gave you the example of the New Year's Eve, you know, and I'm dramatic. Um, I'm also not super great with time management. I always think I can do more in a certain amount of time than I actually can do. Um, uh, I take on too much. But the uh, rest of my executive and other skills are pretty well intact. For people who live with ADHD, it's often the reverse. There are a few skills that are very strong and then a lot of skills that lag or where they're struggling. So all kids, whether they have ADHD or not, benefit from direct instruction about executive functioning skills and how to teach them because that's what the developing brain is. So you put your hand together like this, everybody. This is the size of your brain. I know, you know, Ellen, you think your brain, brain might be bigger, but actually this is the size of our brain. Ellen, smile, that's good. This is the size of our brain. And the brain develops from the back to the front and the inside out. The back of the brain is our physiological brain, our reptilian brain, it keeps us alive. The middle of the brain is our emotional brain. It's where the am amygdala live. It's where our memory and the seat of memory and language. And the front of our brain, um, is our thinking brain, it's the human brain. And that's where those executive functioning skills reside. And they connect to the rest of the brain over time because the brain develops from the back to the front. And the last part, um, the last part of the brain to fully connect is actually the executive functioning skill of self-evaluation, also known as metacognition. So I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Thank you. We have a question in the chat from Rebecca. Oh, thank you so much. Hi, Rebecca. Um, thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to read it to you or do you want to? I got it. 
Um, okay. My child, hold on. Okay. L well, two questions. Lynn, L Lissa asks, uh, would you, or Rebecca also, would you mind detailing a sample collaborative conversation? It helps to have an example in mind. My child, and this is similarly. Okay. So um, I'll go to Lissa's question and then we'll move on. So I'm going to do a collaborative conversation with one of you. So let's see, Ellen, would you be my partner in this? Sure. Okay. So Ellen, um, can you uh, think of something that's an issue for in our relationship that we might be struggling with? Like maybe, you know, I'm late a lot. Okay. Um, do you want me to have a collaborative conversation with you? No, I'm going to have a collaborative conversation with you. Okay. So you're late again, Sharon. What's going on? Yeah, you know, I am late. And I wish I weren't. Um, I just have so many, I just so much stuff I want to do, you know, and what is time anyway? By the way, uh, kids with a people with a, kids with ADHD in particular don't understand time at all. They don't feel time. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't really care about time. It's not that important to me. You know, what's the big deal if I'm a few minutes late here or there? So how do you think it feels to the person like me? We have an appointment and I have to wait for you. And I'm sitting there not not knowing if you're coming or when you're coming or what time or if you're even okay. So how do I deal with that? Um, well, now you're making me feel bad, but you know, I think you probably feel bad and I feel bad that I'm making you wait and worry. So, but I don't know what to do to be, to be better about this. Well, do you have any ideas? Yeah, so, so I was thinking maybe you could call me you know, we use cell phones all the time and just let me know that you're running late. This way, I uh -huh. won't feel like time is being stolen away from me. I'll feel like, oh, a little gift that you just gave me. Or maybe I could text you when I'm leaving so you know when I'm going to get there. How does that sound? As long as I know how long it takes to go from place A to place B, sure, I like that. All right, cool. So why don't I text you when I'm leaving and how long it's going to be to get there? Does that work? That works for me. Yep. Okay. So we had a collaborative conversation just now as adults, but what, what did we do in this collaborative conversation? Can anyone answer? What did you notice we did? Andrea. Communicated. Sorry, say it again. Okay, wait, hold on. Any messages? Ross Green, YouTube examples. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, they're perfect examples. Yes. Um, so, you know, the thing is, what happened in this conversation is Andrea, I mean, oh. Ellen, excuse me, used an I statement about how she felt. And, um, and even when I got a little defensive, she didn't fight. She just kept saying, well, you know, how can we solve this problem? And that's the difference, right? That's, a, that's an example of a collaborative conversation. You cannot have a collaborative conversation when people are dysregulated, right? You cannot have, you need co communication between both parties. Yes, Nancy. Lissa says, um, my child fights me on everything she doesn't want to do and I'm at a loss. She's nine and we're talking about homework, reading, dishes, bath. I've tried rewards, charts, timeouts and her attitude just seems to keep escalating. I need her to do the work, but I also need her to treat me decently. She has ADHD, ODD, and anxiety. I have four kids, the oldest two, nine and 11, both have ADHD, as does their dad. Their other kids are number one. Okay. So what I would suggest in this situation, all the unfun things, yeah. So when kids don't want to do the unfun things, ideally what you'd want to do is pick one thing to work on. People can only change one thing at a time and pick that thing that they want themselves want to see different about themselves. I'm sure it's not fun necessarily for either of your kids with ADHD to struggle in these areas. So let's pick one thing like getting dressed, eating breakfast and like the morning, let's pick the morning routine and then put some, put some um, you know, obviously you put some steps up uh, what those are 
and then you can link that to something they want. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And I know rewards and charts don't work. Sometimes they're too complicated. So you may need to keep it very simple, but um, it is important to, to actually create a plan that work that everybody participates in. So, you know, obviously kids have different levels of responsibility and, and access to different uh, rewards based on their age. But what we want to do is to have a system that applies to everybody. So, you know, you do this, you are that. One family I work with, one child is in second grade and one child is in eighth grade. And they created, they created, um, the older child is very artistic. So they took a chalkboard and they created this chart. They had three things they each had to do and one with post-its. And when they were moved to the finish side, each of them got something that they wanted. Um, usually it was screen time. Um, so, you, you know, and this allowed them and they created that, you know, we had conversation. Well, what would it look like and how do you do that? So engage your kids in that. I think that's very helpful. I want to keep going because I have about a million other things to say and I'm concerned I'm going to run out of time, which I definitely am. So I'm just going to um, quickly uh, go through. Um, uh, I'll come back to your questions. Um, so I'm going to just quickly go through some uh, interventions for um, uh, various executive functioning skills. So to teach impulse and emotional control, uh, you want to slow things down. Um, and this is, I think, the main thing that is important for me to talk about. I and mean, there's a lot of other things, but if I want to leave you with one thing, it's this slide. So impulse and emotional control. Your goal is to slow things down because when people are activated, it's kind of like, um, I'm going to date myself here, but it's like the road runner and Bugs Bunny, right? Um, the road runner is, you know, Bugs Bunny is the road runner. They're running around and the road runner kind of goes off the cliff and is hanging on the air and then crashes down. And that's what happens to us. You know, we, we, when we get upset, our amygdala, our emotions, take over they take that thinking brain they push it to the side it's like you're in a vw they're like it's now driving the car instead of being in the in the back seat and the um, physiological brain is in the trunk um, so we want the human brain the thinking brain to be driving the car and when people are distressed and upset it that it's pushed aside and the emotional brain is driving all over the place so we have to slow things down to get that emotional brain back into the um, where it needs to be. And how we're gonna do that is we're gonna start in a calm moment. And I encourage you to have a weekly family meeting. It can be five minutes, it can be 15 minutes, but a time where you actually talk about what sets you off. What is one thing that really sets you off? And ask questions like, what are some body-based signals that you notice that things are going off? Like, do you, does your heart start to beat? Do you start to perspire? Does your voice get louder? These are all signals that you're headed off the cliff. So we want to um, call a stop, okay? A stop in the action. And this is, this is based on the signals that you're becoming dysregulated or your child is becoming dysregulated. Okay, and we want to set this plan apart. We want to create this plan, stop, think, act. So stop, we're going to cause a pause in the action and we're going to take a time apart, okay? Which is, um, which means that in advance, you're going, to cre you're going to figure out what are some things that you can do and you're going to write these down when you are upset. Can, do you have a safe place to go in the house? Maybe there's a little nook for you that's a calm me down nook. Maybe you create with your kids calm me down boxes with little you know, dollar store activities that only come out when they're stressed. Uh, maybe they you know, hang out with the pet. A one client of mine used to like to read under her bed or listen to music or shoot some hoops or jump on a trampoline. Make a list of soothers. And this is what happens in that time apart because when you're that activated, it takes 10 to 15 minutes for your amygdala to settle down. Okay, that's your fight or flight um, part of your brain. So then when you're settled, you come back after those 10 or 15 minutes, and usually it's 15, you come back. And that's when you have the think. And the think is actually, um, when you talk about what happened very calmly, you ask open-ended questions. 
you state what you observed, you talk about your experience if appropriate, and you avoid blame or analysis. Hmm, I hear what you're saying is, I noticed this, tell me more, I'm listening, okay? The think is about sort of discussing what happened without getting back into it. Then the act is to decide what should happen next. Keep things simple and avoid overwhelm. I like to use the idea of what is the next right thing that needs to occur. And then you do that next right thing. Lessons about how they could do it differently, um, consequences, all of those things will come later. And if there were, and if you do need to do a logical or a natural con a logical consequence, excuse me, because natural consequences may have already happened. Um, you can say, you know, we'll talk about how to deal with this later. Right now, we're going to do X to move forward. And this might include something that you've discussed, like making amends, or how you can say you're sorry, or what you would have liked to have done. This is a great thing to talk about in the think instead of what happened. Okay. Um, we talked a little bit about working memory, and I want to just remind you when you're giving directions to kids with ADHD, you have to use the rule of three. One, I make eye contact with you for some tolerable amount of time. Two, I state my direction. Three, you repeat your direction, the direction I stated to you, not once, but twice, because it's that second time that it gets encoded and shifted from the working memory down into the longer term memory. Now, of course, we're gonna talk about um, motivation. Uh, motivation is linked to several executive functioning skills simultaneously. Um, uh, in kids with ADHD, that, that development of the, the connection of the, uh, the frontal lobes to the, to the rest of the brain is delayed about three years. In kids who are on the spectrum, it's anywhere, it's a minimum of two years. Um, motivation is comprised of initiation getting started on something, often without direction and excessive reminding, time management, doing things on time and meeting deadlines, avoiding procrastination, correctly estimating how long something will take, organization and prioritizing, what you do with your stuff and deciding what's most important if you make a plan, sustained attention, managing your attention and resisting distractions when faced with a task, Goal-directed persistence, setting a goal, staying focused on it, and returning to the task right after an interruption. And finally, focus. Everybody put their hand like this up on their forehead because your focus is your spotlight of attention. And I love to ask kids, where is your spotlight of attention right now? What is it pointing to? How does anxiety affect motivation? And because we're talking a little bit about anxiety tonight, um, Anxiety um, catastrophizes situations. Anxiety is experienced both cognitively and physically. Worried thoughts foster anxio anxious reactions in the body. Um, anxiety reflects all or nothing thinking. There's a negative expectancy. It won't work out. I can't versus let's try and see what happens. So it's more of a fixed mindset rather than a, a um, growth oriented mindset. Um, anxiety um, supports procrastination and increases overwhelm. Now, how do we motivate kids to do the tough stuff? So what's important to think about here is there are two types of motivation, extrinsic, something that refers to an outside request or a reward or responsibility. Um, you, have, you turn in your permission form for a field trip by Friday or you can't go on Monday, an intrinsic motivation striving toward a goal for personal satisfaction. You wanna run three miles instead of two. When a task is fundamentally unrewarding or uninteresting, homework, doing the dishes, taking a bath, putting your clothes away, there's naturally less excitement and less dopamine. So it takes all of us longer to get moving. But for kids with ADHD, who already have lower levels of dopamine or norepinephrine, it takes them even longer. Um, external incentives and rewards encourage kids until the satisfaction of doing it, that internal reward, kicks in firmly in the late teens, early 20s for neurotypical kids. 
So this means that we have to teach, put the have to's before the want to's. And so the um, person who's done rewards and charts, one of the reasons that I feel like a lot of rewards and charts don't succeed is because they're too ambitious and they're often complicated and parents get tired and kids know that you're gonna give up on this plan. So what we want to do is actually create plans where the have to is completed and they earn a want to. And there can be three have tos for every want to, but that's, how, that's the relationship. When kids, ex when kids are unmotivated, they often expect failure. They've given up on themselves because the message that they've received is that adults have been given up on them or been unable to help them or understand them. So we wanna start small when we're trying to motivate kids and look for um, small wins. So uh, let's do this um, poll and please answer in the chat. What seems to interfere with your child's ability to start or stay motivated? Number, and you can read the choices and just put the numbers up in the chat. Okay, organizational challenges, stress and anxiety, overwhelmed. Great, thank you so much. Limited attention span. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so how are we going to help kids get started? Um, we're going to break things down and we're going to work with their innate desire for mastery and dependence. This is the beauty of childhood is that kids want to become independent and successful. They want to be their own person. And so we want to work with that goal, right? And so in order to avoid procrastination, we have to break things down into small parts and no size is too small because if it's small enough to do it, then they'll do it. If it's big enough, if it's anywhere bigger than what they think they can handle, they won't do it. Um, now, there are three types of, perfect, of procrastination and I'd love to hear from you what kind of procrastination you do. So there's perfectionism, which is um, wanting things to be perfect or giving up. And it's related to anxiety and perfectionism can be both motivating or debilitating. It can also help kids create a comforting order to how they do things. Um, uh, avoidance procrastination is when we see something as unpleasant and uh, we give up. Kids will give up because they failed before. Why is this time any different? That task looks like Mount Everest. I don't know where to start. I don't know where to finish. Uh, I, I'm giving up. And then the third type of procrastination, which is my personal favorite, is productive procrastination. So this is when we keep ourselves busy with something else, but we're still avoiding that big task that feels like Mount Everest that we don't really actually want to do. So we're doing other things that need to be accomplished, but are less urgent or important than the task we are avoiding. This makes you feel temporarily better, but it increases long-term stress because ultimately it's a delay tactic. So thank you, Alicia, for sharing. Let me know which type of procrastination do you do, perfectionism, avoidance, or productive? Okay, Veronica, you're right, on, right, right up to my own heart. Now, why should you use incentives? So we, I talked a little bit about this, so I'm gonna move forward on this. One thing that I think is really important is you do not renegotiate the terms of any program if your son or daughter doesn't meet them because collaboration never happens in, in, in under pressure. So we want to talk about the collaborative pr um, uh, process with them and, um, and then we want to do it. And we wanna focus on their efforts as much as the accomplishment. So we, I noticed that you're trying, you didn't quite get it, good for you for making that effort. Um, now, I can, we can come back some time and I can talk all about technology, um, but I have this little an acronym that I created called Sensible Screen Solutions. So you're gonna start with reasonable goals. Screen time in my book is a privilege, it's not an entitlement. Um, you know, what kids are entitled to in the Sharon Celine world is food, clothing, shelter, safety, healthcare, 
education, and love. Screens are not one of those things. And so other than for school, screen time is a privilege. It's a want to. And so we want to attach that to the have to. So you wanna create a plan once you've thought about or talked about with your partner, how much non-school screen time you want your kids to have, when, where, and how it's going to occur. Of course, inappropriate use of screens, such as sexting, online bullying, or visiting inappropriate sites, indicates that your child isn't ready for the privileges that you've given them and means that you have to you know, pull way back. Um, decide how much screen time, not for school, you want your child or teen to have daily. Have a conversation with them about how much they want and decide on a baseline amount. Okay, every day, you know, no matter what, you get your 30 minutes. But if you want that hour and a half, you're gonna have to do this and this to earn that extra hour and a half. And this is really important because how kids ease off the screens can also be um, linked to the screen time they're going to earn. So for example, um, you come home from school, you have a snack, you work for an hour, you get your half hour of screen time automatically. How you get off the screen before dinner, you know, if you have a meltdown, if you scream at me, if you kick me, if you curse at me, that would mean that you would not actually have earned the privilege of the bonus time, which is what you want, that other hour. So we want to really think about um, screen time in, in, the, in the way that we think about a currency, okay? Um, you can attach a bonus time to the completion of chores or a lack of yelling or cursing, any desire behavior that you want. Write your plan down, have everybody sign it, put it up in the kitchen. Um, notice and validate cooperation, expect to make adjustments and have a weekly meeting to talk about how it's going. I personally believe that screens need to stay out of the bedroom at night and off you know, and limited and monitored in some way, and there's a million apps to do this, when you're doing your homework, when you're going to bed. Um, there are other ways to wake up other than your phone. I'm sure you've heard of them. They're called alarm clocks. Um, they work really well. Or you could have Alexa and talk to Alexa about, um, you know, maybe you wanna to listen to music before you go to bed or your child likes to hear a story. That's fine, you can use Alexa to do that and Alexa can wake you up, you don't need your phone. So how are we going to um, teach time management, organization and prioritizing? Because they're all linked. Um, we wanna use calendars, lists and incentives. Um, we want to help kids organize not just their physical space, but their space on their computer. And we want to work with what I call a self-smart system. This is what makes sense to your kids. Like I worked with a girl and of course her mother was an organizer and a professional organizer and she had ADHD like her father and her, her, she was like 10 and her clothes were all over the floor and they were always arguing about this. And we came up with a solution and this was, this came out of my conversations with the child, which was like, well, why do you think you put all your clothes, you know, you pull your clothes out of your closet to put them on the floor? She's like, first of all, I can't see them. And secondly, I want my clothes arranged by color, not by shirts, pants, and, you know, and, and dresses. And I said, well, why? She said, because if I wake up one day and I'm feeling purple, I want to go to my purple section. And I love that. It was so creative. Um, and that was hard to convince the mom to try. But once we did, there were much fewer clothes on the floor. So we, you know, we, and there were still clothes, but it wasn't, it was like 75% better. So we want to help kids. We want to create ordered lists to guide them through their day because most kids with ADHD still struggle with making lists. Teenagers can do a brain dump, but they can't tell you what's most important. And this is a challenge that we can help them with. So we wanna teach them how to and have lists and uh, post things that they can work their way through. And they'll push back on this and they'll say, oh, I hate lists, I don't wanna do lists. Oh, I feel so you know, trapped and controlled by your lists, so whatever. This is the list, this helps you remember, use it or not, you're still responsible. You know, in some way um, that is, that's what, what you have to put out because you're teaching them about prioritizing and sequencing. They don't think that's important to learn, but they will later and they'll do it with 
other people when they get it. Like you might see your oldest child doing it with your youngest child or something. We want to give extra time for organizing their materials and their stuff. Um, and we want to help kids understand the difference between urgent and important. So urgent is a time related issue and important is a importance is a value. So that helps in terms of numbering and prioritizing things. Urgent tasks call us, cause us to react immediately and stop whatever else we're doing to attend to them. There's a time pressure. Important tasks guide us toward our purpose and goals and reflect our life values. And these rely particularly on planning, organization, and initiation. And you can expect to teach these skills over and over again. Um, so I have a question for you, another poll, which is what interferes with your ability to stay organized and prioritized? Anybody? Okay, Rachel, okay, time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Competing demands, four kids, yeah, that would do it. Um, so that would be competing demands. Okay, it's good for us to know as adults what, 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 how, what gets in our way, because if we are aware of that, then we might be able to, to, to think differently about what we're trying to do in a family. It's true with emotional control also. You're probably aware when you're getting heated. In those moments, do what I do. Go to the bathroom, wash your hands, talk to yourself in the mirror, maybe get a glass of water and step outside even though it's 30 degrees. Just make shift something so you can hold, pull it together. There may be chaos on the other side of the door, that's fine. If you're more grounded, it will help teach um, your kids how to take care of themselves and it'll help you intervene more successfully. Not wanting to take the time to reflect, just wanting to be done with the day when the tasks are done, okay, competing demands. Thank you. So I'm just talk a, very quickly about sustained attention. Of course, we wanna put distractions away. One thing I wanna leave you with is the order of work. So a lot of times we expect kids to do their homework in a particular way for a particular length of time. First of all, observe how long your child can actually focus before they need a break. That's the length of their initial work period. You can have a quick break, decide what's gonna happen in that break and for how long, then do another work period, set the alarm if you want. Breaks can be jumping jacks, breaks can be petting the dog, breaks can be getting a snack or having a drink, but when the timer's off, you transition back. Sometimes you might need to lead up, lead, have kids leave post-its about what they were doing so they know what to get back to. Secondly, we wanna think about how kids like to work and talk with them about it. Do you like to do the easy thing first and then do the hard thing and then the medium thing? Do you like to do the hard thing, get it out of the way, then maybe do something medium and then finish with something easy when your brain is tired? Figure that out and then ask them which of their assignments, which of their classes qualifies as hard, easy, media. And, um, and then they can map out how they're actually going to study. We know that multitasking is a myth. So don't let your kids tell you they can multitask. Every time we multitask, we slow down our productivity. It changes how kids learn and it can increase superficiality in social relationships. Because what we're doing when we multitask is we're splitting our attention. And when we switch our attention from one thing to another, we use up more glucose in the brain. That's our fuel. And that lowers the central center, the glucose center in our brain and causes a stress reaction of and a release of that of the stress hormone cortisol. So then we end up feeling depleted and overwhelmed. So it's really important to try to work on doing one thing at a time. And to remember that media multitasking in particular decreases mental efficiency um, because you can't integrate new information as well. And then you become used to for focusing on things for a shorter amount of time. Uh, Co-create reachable goals and, uh, and collaborate on how to get back to things after you drift off. 
Um, I think that's very helpful. Identify what matters when you're creating goals. Really one thing, one hope, and you make your goals within reach, okay? There are two sets of goals, goals about on things they enjoy and really love to do and goals for things that are hard for them, right? And those are not the same, they're different and it's okay to have different goals for different things. So collaborate on a queuing system to help them get back to work and refocus on their goals. Finally, we wanna teach self-evaluation, teach curiosity, ask how am I doing? What's helped me before in this situation? You stay away from that good bad dichotomy and focus on what's working and what's not working. Um, uh, let's see, I wanna, we're gonna talk a little, I don't think we have time for this, but we wanna create an anxiety decelerator, decelerator plan for your family. So you manage your own concerns first, um, you identify their worries, you consider you know, previous successes, and you create a new normal where you're welcoming and adapting to new rhythms that are going on now instead of fighting them. Ident talk about the resources you have now that you didn't have last year. You know, we understand what's so much more about COVID and we understand what safe social interactions are and the importance of exercise. Um, uh, and so we wanna foster resilience and opt for curiosity. Um, pre predictability is very comforting for kids, um, but, um, and we wanna create routines we can keep track of. But we also want to know that it's notice that it's the reaction to the worry, not eliminating it that makes the difference. We want to learn how to step back from anxiety and see how it operates instead of reacting to all of its fearful demands. Because what happens is you can get into a game of whack-a-mole. It's like, oh, I got this anxiety thing, boom, we're good. And then another thing pops up. And that's why it doesn't work. You have to look at the process of how anxiety operates. So validate a concern. You're right to be worried. You're not sure you can handle X. So it's natural to worry in that situation. Let's brainstorm some options. When that negative voice appears in your head, what could you say back to it? Name that negative voice. Maybe it's a worry monster or the uh, you know, annoying anxiety uh, ant um, you know, crawling around and disrupting things. So, and strategize what to do when it happens. Remember that reassurance gives kids short-term decrease in their anxiety, but a long-term increase because they learn to use you or other adults as a crutch instead of intentionally talking to themselves in a way that helps them move forward bravely. So we have to help kids tolerate the discomfort of not knowing and being disappointed. And we have to tolerate the discomfort of not knowing and being disappointed. We all need to you know, dig down and find our resilience as we continue to live in these challenging times. But also as, we, as you continue to raise kids who have challenges with ADHD or a learning a disability or a co-occurring mental health condition or you know, level one autism, et cetera, et cetera. Kids have angry, frustrating, irritating, scary behaviors when they're anxious because they feel out of control, which is why anxiety exists in the first place. We have to maintain our support of kids in that moment without reassuring them and saying, don't worry, you know, you'll get an A, you got an A last time. That's actually not gonna help them. What we wanna say is, of course, you're nervous. This is a new teacher. You're not sure how it's gonna go. You, maybe you'll get an A, that would be great. But if you don't, I still love you and I know you're trying and you'll learn something and then maybe you can you know, get that A you really want next time. Um, not that I care so much about A's, but a lot of people do. Um, so um, in, in this COVID autumn, we wanna focus on those five C's and um, I'm gonna stop because otherwise we have to stop. Um, what I'd like you to do is when this uh, uh, is over is to take a few minutes and write down two things that you've learned today. And maybe you could share those in the chat just now. What are two things that you've learned in this presentation? And let's take some questions. Again, 
I want to remind you to uh, go to this uh, link to get your free downloadable from tonight's presentation. So I'm going to, I'm happy to stay after 9.15 for a few minutes to answer questions because I know I am a long talker. And we took a lot of questions in the middle, so. Okay. Dr. Sharon, could you just talk for a minute about how to use your cards that you developed? Yes. These, I love these. Um, what I like about these cards is that they're very much in the moment or not. So you can say, you know what? I need a tip for self-control. I'm gonna flip one that says what to do when worrying takes over and there's a suggestion for me on the card. Um, or I, I really need um, some compassion, a tip for compassion. I'm gonna flip this and read what it says. So you can do that or you can work through the suits. So you can say, you know what? There are 10 cards. So for the next 10 weeks, I'm gonna do one self-control card. And then after that, I'm gonna do the 10 self, the 10 compassion cards. So either way works. Uh, you can also leave them in the bathroom and your kids can just look at them when they go to the bathroom. Um, but I think it's helpful to use it either way, which is something that you can go through together as a family, or you can uh, and set like a goal like this, or just this week, you know, I'm working on this one skill, what to do when worrying takes over, or this month, and then and pick something else. And you can also ask your kids to pick them too, which gets them a little bit involved. Any other questions? I saw there were some questions in the chat um, that I didn't get to. Um, does anyone have any questions? Let's see, Barbara. I find children with an ADHD profile to be to present as pushy and have trouble asking, for, taking no for an answer. Yes, that's true. I can stay calm and reflective for the first few times I set limits, but after the fourth or fifth time, I have trouble maintaining my calm voice and emotional control. Any advice? Yes. Here's the thing. The more that you continue to engage with them, the higher the, the intensity goes. So um, you're welcome, Lisa. Um, so what we wanna do is you say something once and maybe twice. And then when they come back the third time, you say, I've already talked to you about this twice we're not talking about this anymore. Like, I'm sorry. And that's a hard thing to do because they're gonna act out. They're gonna act out to get you to keep talking about it. And what I would do in a calm moment in that family meeting is to say, I notice that when you ask me something and I say no, and then you come back again and you ask me and I say no, and then I don't wanna talk about it anymore, then you have a meltdown and you're screaming and yelling. What do you think we should do in those situations? And I put it right back on them um, because kids with ADHD don't like to hear no. And I think that's partially because, you know, maybe of how they're, how, how they're wired, they're, you know, impulsive and they're intense, but also I think that they hear no a lot. They hear a lot of negativity. They're redirected. And this is part of, uh, of how anxiety develops so frequently for kids with ADHD. And personally, I think that 34% is low. But they, they, you know, if you are a young child and you hear from your, the age that you start kindergarten, you know, sit still, don't do this, keep this to yourself, blah, blah, blah. It continues on. Eventually, you, you know, you're thinking to yourself, what did I do wrong again? How is it possible I did something else? I wasn't even aware I was doing something. And that's how anxiety, the, the anxiety develops. It's like this hypervigilance. Oops, when am I going to mess up that I didn't even know I was messing up, but I'm getting all this negative feedback for it. Any other questions? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Andrea. Can't hear you. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, your book, What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew. Yes. What would you say are the top two things that your child with ADHD wishes we knew? Um, one, I'm doing the best I can with the resources I have available at any given moment. And I wish I had more resources and I could do better, but I, I, I really am just trying to keep my head above water. And two, um, I wish you would work with me instead of at me. 
I wish you would talk with me instead of at me. And I wish you would notice the good things that I do. So there's three. Thank you. Beautiful. Oh, there has to be, four. I mean, there's the five C's. <laughs> I can't manage myself when you're all upset. So Nancy asks, how do we work with teens on being consistent on doing things? For example, cooks one day, then the next day I'm hungry. Um, you know, I think we, we want to decide what are the things that we want them to be consistent with. So for me, um, that might, that might be self-care, that might be personal hygiene, that might be getting to school on time, going to bed at a reasonable hour. Um, you, you know, you have to decide what are the things that are most important to you and your family, and then, you know, sit down with them and help them do it. I think, um, teens uh, cooking for themselves on a regular basis, you know, they'll make themselves a bagel or they'll, you know, maybe do some, you know, mac and cheese someday. And some days they want you to take care of them. That's actually not an ADHD issue. That's kind of a teen issue because it's the push me, pull me of adolescence. You know, one day I want you to take care of me and cook for me. And the other day it's like, leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you or have you anywhere in my, my sphere. Your breathing annoys me. Any other questions? Uh, let's see, Veronica, what would be an example of a simple behavior plan not too ambitious or complicated? Uh, that's a great question. A simple behavior plan would be aiming at, you know, one thing at a time. So for example, if bedtime, the bedtime ritual is difficult, it's difficult to get them to bathe, it's difficult to get them, you know, to um, pick up their room, it's difficult to get them into bed, um, they get out of bed 7 million times before it's actually the light goes off or, and you have to stay in your, their room with them until they fall asleep. Those are all issues. Which is the one thing you want to work on first? Because you can't ha tackle all those things at the same time. Part of the reason you can is because we want kids to feel a sense of success. Right? I'm making progress. Look, I'm taking my bath and I, you're not yelling at me. Or, you know... Um, or you can link, you know, some of these tasks at night to their screen time the next day. You know, we want to we want to try to help them feel a sense of success. Bedtime is hard for a lot of kids with ADHD. It's hard to disengage. But I would again pick one thing. Sometimes uh, in the morning it's hard to get dressed. Let them sleep in their clothes for the next school the next day. Who cares? You know, if they're willing to do it, the clothes are clean. Whatever. That's helped a number of kids in my practice over the years. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Uh, when I'm telling my son something, he needs to repeat it back twice. Yes, and that's because of how the working how how working memory is connected to auditory processing. So it doesn't it's not held in the same it's not held long enough if if it's one time because one time is is pure repetition. The second time, actually, you have to think about it. Um, let's see. Okay, any questions? Any more questions? I'll take, uh, let's see, I have two new messages. Let's see. Are you running any teen groups this year? Oh, thank you, Andrea. Yes, as a matter of fact, I'm starting two teen groups. One starts on Thursday, and there is still room. These are kids ages 16 to 20. It's on anxiety, managing anxiety in your life. And I'm doing these with Mike Postma. Um, of uh, Gifted and Thriving. And uh, then I have a second group next Monday that starts for middle schoolers. That's almost full. I think there's one space left. And there are, I think, two spaces left in the one for older teens. Um, thank you for the prompt, Andrea, Andrea. And I will be starting up my parenting groups when I get through these groups. So I would like to ask, please look, check out my website download that free downloadable. I'll put it here again for you just in case you didn't get it. Um, and follow me on Facebook. I'll be your friend forever. I also want to let you know that I do a live Facebook session every Friday at 4 p.m. with Attitude on Attitude Magazine's Facebook page. Um, people join from all over the world, adults. We have sessions aimed for adult ADHD, and issues with kids. We cover the, the, whole, uh, the whole span. Um, so please join me. Uh, it's a great and lively group where you get to ask your questions about various topics. 
Thank you so much to Ellen and Andrea for reaching out and for host and to the Bergen County Chad for hosting me. It's lovely being here. And if you have any questions that you didn't want to share in the group or you want to ask me privately, please feel free to email me through my website, www.drsharonsaloon.com. And Sharon, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone who's here for this very informative, very rich, very wonderful um, workshop. You really got a lot of information in, uh, and I maybe you'll come back and talk to us some more because it feels like, okay, we got the overview. Let's get into the weeds. Right. Well, I tried to do an overview because you know, I'm happy to come back and like, I could do a whole thing on motivation or a whole talk on, you know, managing screens and families or just anxiety, but I wanted to give an overview because I haven't met you before. So I want you to get the biggest bang you can. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, and I hope we see you next month for Ari Tuckman's talk as well. And if you can, and it makes sense for you, um, join one of the adult support groups, join the adult support group or one of the parenting groups. Okay, have a good night. Thank you all. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye. Bye. I'll stay on just to say goodbye to you. Say goodbye to you, Ellen and Andrea. Yes, that would be That's great. Um, we want to uh, let me just stop the. I do a debrief. Yeah, I'm going to stop the recording.